to our penultimate lockdown lunchtime number five and today we're going to be looking at some Hartford disasters we're going to start off warm ourselves up it's a very cold day by looking at some fires and before I crack on I will just reassure you all of the disasters we're looking at nobody nobody was killed there was no loss of life so that's slightly reassuring but anyway let's go back to a little bit of the history of firefighting up until the beginning of the 19th century all fire brigades were provided by insurance companies or by parish communities and they were all manned by volunteers who had their expenses paid by the insurance companies so if you didn't have insurance you were in quite a bit of trouble in this photograph on the left you can see the Andrews Phoenix fire office now this is a very special building to the museum it's actually where we started life the museum started here at number 56 4 Street in the fire insurance offices of the Andrews brothers our founders Robert Thornton and William Frampton Andrews and it wasn't till 1913 that they bought the museum building at 18 Ball Plain and moved us there we'd outgrown the insurance office but if you wanted insurance at that time you would have had to trot down there and buy yourself an insurance policy and we've got a policy here from the Unity Insurance Company for Charles Young. He's insured his property for £250. The worst should happen. But you'll notice, even in those days, there's small print, 1861, there's small print at the bottom of the policy that says that if Mr Young gets a steam engine or a stove or a furnace or anything else that produces heat, he's got to let them know so that they can put up the cost of his policy. Because these were seen as very, very big risks. People didn't have the sort of fire prevention procedures in place that we all do today so yes that would definitely boost up his insurance policy premium so that's what you needed to do you had to go and get some insurance and how do people know if you had insurance? Well, you got one of these attractive plaques to put on the outside of your building. And the museum has quite a big collection of insurance plaques from in and around Hartford. And there are some familiar names here. Uh, some of them have amalgamated and survived today, like Royal Sun Alliance. You can see Royal and the Sun Insurance Companies represented here. Some not so familiar, rather battered looking plaque on, plaque on the right. That's for the Hertfordshire and Cambridgeshire Country uh, Fire Office. And that looks as if it's seen a bit of fire action itself but basically you put this on the outside of your building and if there was a fire the fire brigade would turn up but if you didn't have a plaque they might go home again and leave you to it so it was quite an important thing to have particularly if you were in business but eventually things improved and local councils started setting up their own fire services but they needed equipment to do that this is the Newsham pump it was invented around 1730 by Joseph Newsham it was an ingenious machine for firefighting this pump is in the museum collection some of you you may have seen it if you visited our open days at our seed warehouse store it's since been uh, reinvigorated by some wonderful volunteers at the fire service museum it was in a terrible state it was basically a, a box of bits of wood and they put it back together very lovingly and had a few parts made for it that had gone missing but here it is when it first arrived at the museum probably not long after we opened here in 1913 um, sitting in Bull Plain and you can see it's got these two pumping handles so two men would stand either side and pump water a hose would be put into the river or another water source and they'd pump that water through the machine and it would then pump it out through another hose to put out the fire but you'd need quite a lot of people with quite a lot of pumps for this to really be effective on any major fire so um, it wasn't an ideal situation this is the Hartford Corporation Fire Brigade around the turn of the century and um, they look like they mean business and um, by this time they've got a horse-drawn fire engine pump which is partially obscured by the firefighters posing there. Amongst this group is Captain Thomas Pamphilon and members of the Pamphilon family had a long history of taking part in the Hartford Fire Brigade um, as volunteers. Later on it was captained by his son Harry but uh, what, what was good about the Pamphilon family is that they were a family of plumbers so they knew all about water and it was very useful in their skills as firefighters and in fact another link to the museum the Andrews brothers purchased 18 bull plane from the Pamphlon family where they used to have their plumbers shop so again the museum has sneaked into the history of firefighting now Hartford needed a fire station and it had some makeshift fire stations around the town at one point it was in the wash uh, then in the 1890s it moved to Railway Street at that point they had 10 men on on the books but in 1901 at a cost of three thousand pounds Hartford Corporation uh, built this wonderful fire station on Mill Road almost opposite the Hartford East station and you can see it's a lovely lovely building and the very importantly tells you if you look at the bottom of the picture there's a 
a close-up of the sign that ran along the front. It tells you who's responsible for this wonderful building. It's the mayor, Alexander Perkis Ginn. It's the town clerk, Mr. Sorder, the corporation surveyor, Mr. Jevons, and of course, Mr. Kemp, who built it. But there's not actually any mention of those brave firefighters who actually did the work. But eventually, um, the building was demolished in the 1980s. You can see in the top, there's an image of it just before that happened. But you'll notice that the building that stands there now, it's these rather smart flats on Mill Road. The corporation plaque that hung on the fire station from the moment it was built was taken off and taken care of and put onto the front of those flats. So you can see that today, a little bit of Hartford history when you walk down Mill Road. But I like this larger picture. It's not that clear, but if you peer through the doors, you can just see those horse-drawn fire engines inside the fire station. Here's our current fire station on London Road. Um, it's a bit more exciting. It's also an ambulance station and it had all of the top of the range equipment. But we'll go back to around the 1900s and we'll fast forward to 1914. Here they are uh, demonstrating the horse-drawn fire engine for the benefit of everybody's amazement and amusement. But things were moving on and steam power was uh, getting involved in all kinds of industries, including firefighting. And in 1914, around that time, Part of a corporation were very pleased to get this Merriweather, a steam fire engine. And this was the gift of everybody's favourite local millionaire, Sir Edward Pearson of Brickendenbury Park. We met him the other week. He purchased the site for Hartford War Memorial. So he's full of good works around the town and supporting us all the way with the benefit of his funds. But this steam Merriweather, it had a boiler which had to be ignited and stoked as soon as it was started. And the idea was that by the time you reached the fire, there'd have been enough pressure built up in it to operate the pump but again it still worked in in the way of fortunately for Hartford surrounded by rivers we have plenty of water sources so you'd still have a hose going into the river here we are a very familiar building of Adams Wharf far from the museum um, and these men and boys are looking on uh, in enthusiasm at this wonderful contraption which is going to change the face of firefighting in Hartford and so this was a wonderful gift from Sir Edward Pearson but not everybody was thrilled with it some people were suspicious and didn't think it was going to work as effectively as a machine that was going to be pumped by hand by people. And the reason I know this is there's this wonderful poem that appeared in the Mercury about the same time it's a very long poem so I won't read it all out but basically the people that backed the new steam engine were challenged by naysayers to a public demonstration and in the poem it says the backers laughed aloud and said we know she'll stand the strain when you see what she can do you won't poke fun again and so um, an epic battle took place at this public demonstration the night before the steam engine was cosseted and looked after and made made ready for the big display but on the day despite having the finest food, very expensive coal from Wales and being taken care of, as soon as it started off, as if it would never stop, just as friends began to crow, it fainted on the spot. So the steam engine has let them all down. Something has gone very, very wrong. And then they liken it to a poorly patient. They tried all means to bring it round. Its mouth they filled with food. A draught to its inside they gave before they said things rude. They rushed the patient up and down until its joints were sore. Some say its friends were really sad and others nearly swore. So it was very embarrassing for those people who were for the steam engine. Things obviously went wrong, but it can't have gone too wrong because the steam engine stayed in use by the Hartford Corporation Fire Department for, for quite a long time. And here it is, it's been called out to Old Hall Green, St Edmunds College, a fire there, and a most exciting day for all the little boys at St Edmunds College. Here it is, taking water from, from the pond there to extinguish the flames. So it can't have been all bad if it made it all the way up to Old Hall Green. Um, and here's a shot. I don't have a date for this, but I know that where you can see the word stout, that's the Maidenhead Inn on Maidenhead Street. And these firefighters are up on the roofs trying to put out a fire. And you can imagine the extreme lengths of hoses they would have needed. Uh, sometimes they're plugging into water mains, but quite often they're having to duck back down to Bull Plain or to the wash to access water directly from the river. So they would have needed very, very long hoses. So we're going to look at a couple of fires that have really taken a role in Hartford's history. Again, don't worry, nobody was killed, but we'll start off here in Maidenhead Street and we're looking at Arnold Thomas's drapery shop. You can see I've just closed in on it on the right hand side. You can see his name on the blinds there. And Mr. Thomas was on his way to church on one Sunday in May 1917. And he thought he'd pop in and get some letters. 
and picked them up and made his way to the Baptist church at Cowbridge. And no sooner had he got there sir, when he was confronted by a messenger who hurriedly panting up to him to tell him that his uh, shop was on fire. So the Hartford Fire Brigade were called immediately. They were under the leadership of Harry Pamphlon. He turned up with the steam engine, so we know it's still working. By this time, the flames are really uh, gathering ground and there was an occupant on the floor above the shop who had to jump to safety from the window, but fortunately he was unhurt. But it was then described as becoming a raging furnace and the Ware Fire Brigade had to be called for. And this is a, a story that, that repeats itself. We've talked before about the rivalry between Hartford and Ware, but in times of trouble, Ware have always come out to help us when we've needed it. So that's a really nice side of things. But anyway, Ware have arrived. They've taken charge of the building at the end of Maidenhead Street, cornering Bull Plain. That's their job. They're going to be taking care of that and making sure that doesn't go up but it's still causing a lot of problems. It's very worrying. It's a very densely packed area. There's Dolphin Yard behind that shop there with lots and lots of little flammable cottages, buildings very close together. The old coffee house in on the opposite side of the road is starting to get a bit scorched. Luckily for Mr. Thomas, there's a war on. So there are lots and lots of soldiers billeted at the barracks on London Road. So they were called out to come and help with the firefighting. And the Mercury tells us that soldiers with rifles assisted by the police form Cordons across all entrances to Maidenhead Street and Bull Plain and effectually kept the large crowd that had now assembled from hampering the movements of the workers. And here we can see fire in progress. Unfortunately, an event like this was, was a bit of an attraction and uh, an awful lot of looky-loos came out and were hampering the progress of those people fighting the fire. So it was a bit difficult for them with all of these people trying to mill about. Now, at this point, the conflagration was like a seething cauldron, according to the, mer the Mercury, and both Thomas's and Hilton's next door, both those shops completely collapsed and sparks were flying and people were getting very worried. Though It was a very breezy day and there were a lot of sparks actually flying as far as Mill Bridge and at Illets Mill, stuff caught, caught light in, in the yard there, but was quickly extinguished. So there was a real concern that this fire was going to take control of a very large part of the town. So then they sent for the Hatfield Fire Brigade and they were a great addition because not only did they turn up with their motor tractor and steamer they also borrowed a fire engine from the Great Eastern Railway Company so that was a huge help to everybody and here you can see some of the scenes of devastation of that fire. There's a nice bunch of looky-loos there getting a good, a good view. You'll notice from these that a lot of the firefighters don't have any protective clothing on. There's not even helmets. They seem to have these sort of almost berets perched on their heads. Now, behind Thomas's was Dolphin Yard. Uh, this is a later picture of Dolphin Yard. This is it in 1932. The lady on the right in shadow, her name's Charlotte Judd, um, and those are her sisters behind her, and two of those children are hers, Thomas and Diana. And while it's a later picture, you know, it's not 1917, it's 1932, you can see these cottages. They all look extremely flammable. They don't look like they're going to be able to withstand a fire. So there was a lot of, a lot of concern about this. But those soldiers who'd come out from the barracks um, again took charge in helping people in the area and they started to help move furniture out of the Dolphin Yard cottages and the Mercury described this as a kindly and thoughtful act which was greatly appreciated by the poor people in the distressing circumstances with the imminent fear of the destruction of their homes. Now obviously these people must have been terrified but they were a hardy sort and they soon got over it because it goes on to say that they however calmly reconciled themselves to the situation and later in the day were seen partaking of their dinner a rather belated and scrappy meal in the open air so you know there's a fire raging on but we can't interfere with meal times we'll get on with that we'll just do it outside so that was good news but again more sort of nosy people were causing problems for the firefighters in fact people were actually motoring in from other places and trying to get up onto neighboring rooftops to get a good view of the fire so causing more and more problems for those people fighting it but it says everybody was very loud in their praise of the help that the soldiers had provided uh, they scaled ladders climbed over the roofs like squirrels and wherever their services were required, they went and performed any task allotted to them with cheerfulness, smartness and efficiency. So uh, lucky for Maidenhead Street, there was a war on. And here's just another couple of pictures of the aftermath. You can see those two shops completely gone. Miraculously, the building on the corner of Bull Plain seems to have withstood all of this trouble. And there's a nice quote here from Thora Blake. She wanted to go out and join the onlookers, but was forbidden to do so by her mother. 
Now here you can see that building on the corner of Ball Plain and Maidenhead Street creeping in just at the very edge of the photograph you can see that empty lot where those buildings have completely gone destroyed by the fire. This building is still here but it looks very different today. Uh, the third story has basically been sliced off that no longer exists and the ground floor that very attractive facade we can see here that's been replaced by something much less attractive in my opinion. It's now occupied by the jewellery shop there on the corner so do have a look when you're next passing by. But after the fire, we'd had so much trouble with people coming to have a ghoul at everything. But even after the fire, there were difficulties. And it said, bear in mind, this fire broke out on the Sunday. By Tuesday, things had calmed down and had cooled down. But that morning, the children were commencing a diligent search for booty. But it was not long before they were observed. And the stentorian voice of a burly police constable soon put them to flight. So thankfully, no children were hurt in, in that debris there. So we'll move on and um, we're going further back in time. This is All Saints Church around 1880 and it looks very very different from the All Saints we know and love today. It was a 15th century church, it looks very pretty. Um, here's a nice picture of the inside, again very charming but nothing like the very grand church that we, we now enjoy today. But unfortunately disaster struck in December 1891 when the church was totally gutted by fire and here you can see it's just a shell, it must have been absolutely heartbreaking for the parishioners and for the congregation who used the church to see it in this state. It was absolutely devastated and in fact these pictures of the interior I think are probably the most upsetting for people who would have gone there worshipping every week to see it in that state must have been a, a terrible terrible time for them. But fortunately this is Hartford and people got together and started fundraising but just like the Maidenhead Street fire this sort of tragedy did attract tourism so uh, this is some wonderful merchandise that was produced at the time. I particularly like the photograph on the top right it's the same image we saw earlier of the 15th century church but here uh, someone has cunningly painted in flames and tinted it so that we can see how it might have looked as it burst into flames and I do think Think how upsetting that might have been for somebody who loved the church to see this sort of merchandise on display and people sending it off to their relatives. I can't imagine any situation where I would feel it was a good idea to send a, f a postcard of a church on fire to anybody I knew but you know we're living in slightly different times. But as I say the great and the good got together and they spent a few years fundraising and this took the form of all kinds of things from bazaars to theatrical productions and they worked incredibly hard and the new church was finally dedicated in 1895 and it really is a testament to the hard work and dedication of those people. I love this photograph on the right, this is the work in progress and this um, amazing platform viewing carriage, I don't know of any other term to call it, up above the whole site the foreman can look down, um, his little shed is on tracks and can go back and forth and he can observe the whole site. I've personally never seen anything like it but it looks marvellous. And here was the church shortly after it was dedicated, but it hasn't got its tower, it didn't get its tower until 1905. Fundraising takes a long time, um, no matter how hard they were working, it was a little bit longer before the tower arrived. Bottom picture there you can see, this is the arrival of the new bells in 1907. It must have been absolutely wonderful to hear those bells pealing again after so many years following the tragedy. Again the museum's gagging in on this, if you look two bells in from the right Right. The two white bearded gentlemen there in hats are our museum founders, William Frampton and Robert Thornton Andrews, glaring away on this happiest of day as the new bells arrive. But this wasn't the first time that All Saints had been affected by fire. There's a wonderful story from 1762 where it's recorded that during the time of divine service a fireball fell upon the church and greatly terrified the congregation. It burst in the Blue Coat Boys Gallery with a terrible noise that was heard in every house in the town but did no other damage than singeing a boy's hair. So that's fortunate, it's just one of the children from the Blue Coat School, Christ Hospital, who's had a bit of an incident but he's fine. And apparently it was recorded that these fireballs had happened at many other churches around the country and I'm sure there was some sort of supernatural story attached to that but we don't know what it is. So we'll move on. 
And we'll fast forward into time to 1940 and number four, Marketplace. Here on the picture on the left, this picture is slightly earlier and the, the building is occupied by Simpson and Company. But at the time of the fire, it was Botsford and Whiteman, the hardware store. And many of you all know Botsford's eventually moved around to Castle Street. But at the time, it was here in Marketplace looking onto the Shire Hall. Now, the fire broke out in the oil store behind the shop. Um, remember, it's a hardware store. There's lots of flammable things there, so it's going to be a worry. And unfortunately for poor Trevor Brown, a youth who was employed at the shop, he was slightly burned by the flames trying to put them out. But the Hartford Ware and Hoddesdon fire brigades were called straight away. Again, it's a very densely packed area. Lots and lots of buildings very close together. They knew they were going to have some difficulty. And here you can see those firefighters tackling them fire on the left this firefighter's trousers are absolutely soaking wet what should be remembered as well would it, it would have been quite a strange experience in that it was february it was very very cold there were icicles on the telephone wires so this contrast in very cold weather and the raging heat must have been a very very strange working environment for them but again, the fire engines had to be connected up to the River Lee down at the bottom of Bull Plain. So again, these huge lengths of hoses running through the town in order to tackle this. And it's attracting a crowd again. You know, there are still these nosy people wanting to see what's going on. But unfortunately, the heat took hold of the lower part of the building where there was a stock of cartridges. So they started popping off as well. And it must have been quite frightening. I find this photograph absolutely terrifying, looking at these firefighters perched precariously, particularly the man on the left at the top of these extraordinarily high ladders. It looks incredibly unsafe. And again, I can only see one person wearing a helmet here. So these firefighters, again, all volunteers, and really putting their lives at risk to save people and property in Hartford. So I'll just go back a slide and you'll notice that next door to Botsford's is McFarlane's. This is a dress shop. They've got lots of lovely dresses and gowns in there. So it's a big worry for them. But volunteers helped move all of the stock out of the shop and their furniture. And that was held at the Salisbury for safekeeping. And again, it's another story of people coming to help. When word spread, a furniture firm arrived bringing their van and helped clear out other neighbouring properties to try and limit any damage. So the whole community were getting together and this is a nice quote from Sister Lacey talking about the ice hanging on the telephone wires and how strange it was to have this heat of the fire. But at the time, there were actually several prisoners of war being employed in the town centre breaking up ice. They were based at Hartford Heath. Again, there's a war on. So that must have been a very, very strange sight indeed in that you've got all of these firefighters and then these prisoners of war in their distinctive uniforms breaking up ice nearby. And here is the building at the end. You can see it's just a shell. The entire interior of Botsford's has gone. It, it is all completely gone. So that's, that's a great shame. But McFarlane's have come off okay. They look pretty steady. And the Paget buildings next door have survived unscathed. So that was really good news. In fact, one of the firefighters, one of the team, was Harry Botsford, the son of the owner. He was an auxiliary firefighter. And he helped to curb this blaze that destroyed his family's business. So we'll move on. We think we're warm enough now from all of those fires. So let's think about storms and floods. Now this picture is a bit of a cheat. It's not Hartford. It is in fact Great Hormy, the Church of St Nicholas, but it's a great picture. Obviously not for the church. This is a gale in 1989 that blew the roof off the South Isle and wrapped it around this tree. And it absolutely is an extraordinary picture. But Hartford's had more than its fair share of storms and floods. We've got four rivers meeting in the town. We're in a valley. These sort of things are going to happen. Happen. But one of the greatest storms in Hartford's history actually dates from 1738, when it's recorded, particularly Benjo and Hartingfordbury were, were affected because they were agricultural areas. But in fact, the town of Hartford petitioned to the Chancellor for arms for those people living in those areas. Because at the time of this huge storm, the fields were full of crops. It was July, we were preparing for the harvest, and apparently they were exceedingly good crops. When the storm struck, and it describes hailstones that were six inches wide, uh, it sounds phenomenal. They beat down and destroyed the crops. Buildings had their thatch torn and windows shattered. Cattle were cut and bruised and people were reduced to poverty with no corn or sustenance for the winter. 
I just think of those poor cattle with these six inch hailstones raining down on them. It must have been terrifying. But the loss from this storm was estimated at over £5,000 then, and that's about £1.2 million today. So fortunately, we've not seen anything quite as extreme as that since, but we have had our fair share of storms and floods. So here's poor old All Saints again, riddled by tragedy and, and disasters. Uh, this is the great storm of 1987, the one that got Michael Fish into so much trouble. And you can see several beautiful mature trees absolutely ripped from the ground. Now let's flash back to 1911, this big thunderstorm that covered the area. It was particularly significant for a few reasons in that so many people were affected. This is Hartingfordby Road, just up the railway bridge, just past our current petrol station. And you can see this little car is caught in the water. The owner of this car is Mr. Locker Lampson. He's an MP from Knightsbridge and he was being driven under the bridge when he got stuck and had to be pulled out by horses. And I imagine that his a driver probably didn't last that much longer in his position after that. At the same time, here's poor old Harold, Harold Wickham of Wickham's Brewery. You can see the weir here. Wickham's Brewery uh, was close to where Hartford Theatre is now. The site's occupied by those little muse houses at Mill Bridge. But at the time, the brewery was there. And poor Harold Wickham uh, was struck by lightning and temporarily lost uh, the use of his arms and legs. Um, so that must have been absolutely terrifying for him. But apparently the next day all was well and he was able to get about, but still suffering from the effects of the shock. And here is Millbridge, another shot of it from the latter part of the 19th century. Millbridge had a lot of problems with flooding. This is a similar site. Uh, Wickham's would be on the left hand side of this photograph. And you can see Millbridge itself at the back. It doesn't look very familiar. We didn't get our current Millbridge bridge until 1927. So it looks a bit different to how we, we think of it today. But it was constantly flooding. And in fact, even in 1762, in Carrington's diary, he talks of a flood that washed, that washed through the wash knee deep and he describes a very optimistic baker who, who lived there who carried on about his business stood up to the middle in water to mold his bread set it in the oven even though the oven was full of water as well he says and meanwhile the flood was driving small buildings and outhouses away and damaging other dwelling houses so I do like to think of this baker just going about his business as outhouses fly past the window in the current of the flood I'm not sure the bread would have been particularly delicious afterwards but I admire his work ethic. So we'll move on to the Great Flood of March 1949. Now we know quite a bit about it from the newspaper, the Hertfordshire Mercury has come out in force which is really good uh, but this is the only photograph that we have of it. And this is Chambers Street off Cow Bridge, you can see the Baptist Church there and it's something of a lake. However this area was afflicted again about 20 years later, 1968 and we've got quite a few pictures of those so I'll be looking at those and referring back to some of the reports uh, from 49. So here's Cowbridge in 68. There's the poor old Baptist church up to its knees again. Uh, they really do seem to suffer. And these people are getting a lift on a tractor to get into town. Um, I love this photograph. These children are having the time of their lives, the excitement of being driven through the water on a manure truck. I'm not sure all the mums are enjoying it quite so much. I do admire those brave people wading through the water over there near the Bell and Crown pub. Uh, these boys have got the right idea, they've got straight for the canoe and are negotiating it quite easily. In 1949, Cowbridge was so bad that it was it was classed as three feet deep, and in fact, one housewife said that it was up to the top of her tabletop. But again, people came out to help, and Councillor Skinner organised meals to be taken to those residents who were stranded, and that was taken via horse and cart. So the poor horses had to wade through that to get to them. And you can see here is pictures of Bean Road and Port Vale. Bean Road top right, it looks like the sea. The River Bean has completely burst its banks and that's gone over into the streets here. The young boy in the bottom left, he's got a blow up dinghy there in order to get through Port Vale. So something had to be done and in 1978 they, they dredged the bean here at Cowbridge and laid all kinds of pipe work and a flood prevention scheme and that does seem to have made a difference to Cowbridge although Port Vale um, and Bean Road are still still continue to have problems. 
Right, so let's move on to Horns Mill. This is the Hatfield Road at Horns Mill, and you can see this poor car, how they've got this far, I really don't know. They must be very optimistic, or I'm not sure, um, but people do make a, go, make a go for it and do end up getting stranded. And the same in 1949, there's actually a report of in Brickenden Lane, just around the corner, a motorist sitting on top of a small saloon car being swirled around the road. Can you imagine spinning around on the roof of your car? It must have been terrifying water was up to the roof fortunately he was able to shout for help and a passerby heard him and came to his rescue but at the horns mill glove factory webs they weren't going to be put off by a mere flood and the girl workers were carried through the floods to the mill so that was no excuse not to go to work doesn't matter there's a flood get in there and get on with your job and here's horns mill again it's the heart's horns they've got um, some sandbags up at the door to prevent the water getting in and this little girl's having a lovely time splashing through in her wellies and of course the meads as we all know the meads constantly submerged underwater throughout the year and perhaps it's one of the reasons that it survives today as a beautiful spot that we can all enjoy it certainly can't be built upon Here's a couple of pictures taken from the Chabwell Spring End heading towards Ware and they're sort of 20 years apart but the one on the right from 89 it looks like the sea again and the flyovers become something like a pier heading off out into the water. So I'll finish up with this gratuitous picture of a pig escaping from a flood. I love this photograph, I love the expression of interest on the boy's face as, as he uh, regards the pig. I don't know where in Hartford this picture was taken, so if anybody recognises the location I'd love to hear about it. I hope you've enjoyed this little history of Hartford disasters and I hope you can join me next week for our very last lunchtime in this series. Again if you have any questions please do email me, lots more images on our image website, Hartford Museum museumimages.org. If you've enjoyed this talk and are able to, we'd be very grateful if you made a donation to hartfordmuseum.org, scroll down and click on the donate button. So I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have and I really look forward to seeing you next week hopefully and take care. Bye bye.